It's hot out there, but let's blow them off the line of scrimmage. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. They rank as professional football's winningest organization over the last decade, and the profits say their Super Bowl dreams finally will be fulfilled. Carrying the NFL's best record and longest winning streak into this AFC championship game, Kenny Stabler and the mighty Oakland Raiders hover on the brink of a Super Bowl berth. Stabler's shrewd veteran leadership carried the Raiders to their best finish since their 1967 Super Bowl team. And now only an old nemesis stands between the Raiders and their return to pro football's biggest game. But while Joe Green and the Steel Curtain pose a threat to Kenny Stabler, Franco Harris' questionable condition poses a problem for the defending champion Steelers. The Steeler attack is based upon a strong performance from its running backs. And in Harris' absence, the full burden of moving the football would fall upon quarterback Terry Bradshaw. The Steelers will need a big game from Bradshaw to win. But the seven-year veteran missed a lot of action during the Steelers' stretch drive and might prove a bit rusty. One way or another, the Raiders have the weapons to deal with him. If there's a psychological advantage, it may belong to the Steelers, who have beaten the Raiders in the last two AFC title games. But somehow, one gets the feeling the Raiders aren't intimidated in the least. The Pittsburgh Steelers got here largely because of their famous steel curtain defense. In their last 10 games, Pittsburgh allowed a mere four touchdowns. And early on, they gave Kenny Stabler a view of their safety blitz. The Raider line usually affords Ken Stabler outstanding protection, but they could not stop the steel curtain from descending in period one. Still, the Steelers had their problems, for while their defense derailed Oakland's air game, the offense could not move the football. The initial shock came when number 46, Reggie Harrison, opened the game at fullback in place of the injured Franco Harris. Harrison is a stocky third-year player in the Booby Clark mold. Big, strong, tough, but somewhat immobile. His inability to turn the corner left the Steeler running game dead in its tracks. Far less agile than Franco, Harrison fell prey to Raider pursuit as Oakland shut down Pittsburgh's ground attack early. Forced to throw, Bradshaw went to Harrison, but the ball had no handle, and the Raiders had his number. A disconsolate Franco Harris looked on as Oakland completely stifled Pittsburgh's offense, then turned in the game's first pivotal play. Running back Hubert Ginn interrupted punter Bobby Walden's follow-through while getting a piece of the football. The ball rolled dead on the Steeler 38. An arrow man soon capitalized on Oakland's inspired special teams play for the game's first points. Mann's 39-yarders split the uprights as Oakland fans celebrated a three-point lead in this AFC championship game. In title games, often the first point scored proved to be significant. And this year, Oakland's rugged defense and special teams had gotten them on top. Pittsburgh trailed in the game, but their proud defense could not be held responsible. On three possessions, Oakland had produced only 48 yards of total offense. And the steel curtain hardly showed signs of wear. But while the Steel Curtain controlled the Raider attack, the Steelers did not show the slightest semblance of offense. Forced to throw, Terry Bradshaw could not solve the riddle of Oakland's eight-man zone coverage. Oh, for five passing in period one, Bradshaw continued to flounder in period two. Despite outstanding protection, Bradshaw's bullets over the middle consistently bit the dust.
curiously, the coaches calling Pittsburgh's plays were throwing as often as they were running, when in fact the Steeler offensive line seemed capable of opening holes in Oakland's 3-4 defense. But Pittsburgh's ground efforts were sandwiched between Bradshaw's ill-fated passing attempts. On second and 11 from his own 19, Bradshaw's eighth pass of the afternoon brought disaster to the Steelers. Linebacker Willie Hall's interception and return carried to the Steeler one. Way back in week one, Willie Hall's fourth quarter interception set up Oakland's game-winning field goal and Oakland's come from behind win over the same Pittsburgh team. Today, his big play put the good guys in prime scoring position, but the last yard is often the hardest one to get. Pittsburgh twice stopped Oakland cold. Another fruitless line plunge would have set up a crucial fourth down situation and a big decision for the Raiders, but Kenny Stabler would not let that happen. Stabler surprised the steel curtain by sending Clarence Davis over right tackle for the score. The heated battle was growing more intense, and for the first time, the bad blood between these two AFC rivals came to the surface. But all extracurriculars aside, Oakland had moved to a commanding 10-point lead, and Raider fans enjoyed the triumph of the moment. Trailing by two scores, the burden fell hard upon Terry Bradshaw. Oakland had shut off all ground routes to the end zone, forcing Bradshaw into one passing situation after another, a circumstance Bradshaw dislikes. But on third and nine from his own 30, Bradshaw finally rediscovered the touch. Frank Lewis' big 11-yard reception gave the Steelers their initial first down of the game. Likewise, it lifted Bradshaw's confidence. Following two unsuccessful running plays, Bradshaw returned to the air. Once again, his pass found its way home, this time to wide receiver John Stallworth. Stallworth's 18-yard reception moved Pittsburgh to the Raider 37, their deepest penetration of the afternoon. Bradshaw's mid-range passes were exposing a few soft spots in Oakland's outstanding zone coverage. On the very next play, Bradshaw again went over the middle, this time to Lynn Swan as Pittsburgh's air game continued to find the range. Swan carried to the Oakland seven-yard line as Pittsburgh moved into view of Oakland's end zone for the first time on the afternoon. On first down, Bradshaw went to his most potent goal line weapon, and Reggie Harrison powered home. Seventy-five yards in eight plays, the Steelers were still kicking, and momentum suddenly appeared up for grabs. But just when the steel curtain threatened to move in and take charge of the game, Kenny Stabler and the Raider offense enjoyed their finest hour. Oakland would move 69 yards in 13 plays on this drive. And all along, Stabler's superb play calling and Raider execution kept the steel curtain from gaining a foothold. Cliff Branch's cross-country sojourn picked up eight big yards but the Raiders were convinced they could run at Pittsburgh's right side of Dwight White and Ernie Holmes. And with pro bowlers Gene Upshaw and Art Shell paving the way, Oakland took it to the Steelers on the ground.
Mixing his plays to perfection, Stabler took advantage of Down's situation, field position, and Pittsburgh's tendency to send the big pass rush on apparent passing downs as the Raiders blew open holes. Eight running plays and four passes after this drive had begun, Oakland needed four yards to break the Steelers' backs. On this drive, Kenny Stabler showed the Steelers everything from play action to third down running plays. Pittsburgh had no idea what to expect. Stabler had the steel curtain in his hip pocket. Warren Bankston's touchdown grab culminated Oakland's storybook perfect drive and nailed Pittsburgh's coffin shut. Oakland had marched the length of the field in just under five minutes and had torn the heart out of the Steelers. When they needed to be tough, the Raider offense had reached back, and now they took a 10-point lead to the locker room at the half. The Pittsburgh Steelers desperately needed a psychological jolt in the final two periods, a reaffirmation of their poise, purpose, and power. There is no better remedy than a heavy dosage of hits laid on by the Steel Curtain defense, a unit that was rendered almost comatose by the Raiders in the first half. Although they clouded Raider heads with cobwebs, Pittsburgh could not deny Kenny Stabler and an Oakland team that smelled victory and the roses that grow in Pasadena. A blend of pinpoint passing and a bit of daring strategy resulted in Oakland's third touchdown. With it fourth and one from the Steeler 24, Warren Bankston number 46 was inserted as a third tight end, presumably for additional blocking muscle. Instead, he proved a Trojan horse who was unwittingly allowed entry to the Steelers' secondary. Another look at this well-laid trap reveals that Stabler's play fake to number 40 Pete Banaszak allowed Bankston an unmolested route to the crucial first down. This ruse worked again at the goal line with much greater dividends, a climactic touchdown, this time by running back Pete Banaszak, number 40. A second angle shows that Stabler victimized a maximum blitz on second and goal by lobbing over the rush to the embarrassingly wide-open Banaszak. Touchdown ballooned the score to 24 to 7, and while Oakland fans grew flush with the rosy glow of impending victory and were pumped up by adrenaline, the lifeless Steelers looked totally spent in their chase for a third Super Bowl. One Steeler who never asks for quarter and never gives it is Jack Lambert, number 58, the Steelers' all-pro middle linebacker. Mean Joe Green once said that Lambert is so mean, he hates himself. No one quibbles with someone who looks as fierce as a Halloween hobgoblin, acts like he has St. Vitus dance, was on a game-long hunt for a mother load of silver and black. Pro football players rarely quit, rather they let up. Lambert never does. He plays hard from first gun to last, from sideline to sideline, goal line to goal line. He is a 60-minute man.
But like Hannibal at the gates of Carthage, no one man, no matter how cunning or willing, can defeat a whole army on a crusade. This day belonged to an army of black shirts, one rich in tradition and laden with talent. Coupled with an offense that controlled the clock, the Raider defense controlled the Steelers. These are the two most physical teams in pro football. When they play, the stands quake and earth shakes. For four quarters, Oakland tattooed Pittsburgh with a volley of stinging hits and dominated them physically, something few teams have ever been able to do. For every hard yard gain, there was an equal measure of punishment exacted. Oakland's defense disguised their coverages in a maze of false fronts and blind alleys in order to shut down the Steelers' dangerous wide receivers. The only vacuum in their secondary was the middle ranges, where Pittsburgh tight ends were granted some precious seconds of freedom. Number 89, rookie Benny Cunningham, plied the heart of the Oakland zone for some valuable gains, but never a game-breaker. Missed opportunities and the failure to find the open man in this labyrinth of coverages frustrated the Steelers on the infrequent opportunities they had to put up some points. Playing the clock and with the scoreboard firmly in hand, the Raiders often allowed Pittsburgh tight ends to breeze through their secondary. These successes proved fool's gold for the finders because when it counted, the Raiders' defensive trap snapped shut on the Steelers. The momentary frustration of number 26, Skip Thomas, paled before the agony endured by Lynn Swan. Number 88 came to this game a marked man and left it a masked man, totally stripped of his skills and psyche. Double covered and bumped off stride all afternoon, Swan was forced to run up the backs of Oakland's deep defenders. All week long, a heated dialogue transpired between Swan and Raider defensive backs. It ended on the field when Oakland completely denied Swan the ball in the clutch and won not only the war of words, but the war for the roses in Pasadena. For Lynn Swan, Terry Bradshaw, and the rest of the Steelers, the magic had vanished. The bombs diffused and kicked aside. The season cruelly crushed, the dreams all gone up in smoke. On this day, the Raiders laid waste to the Steelers' hex. There were no last-second miracles, no frozen fields to numb their offense. Just the happy feeling that after years of being second best, Oakland was deservedly number one in the AFC. The game ended like it began with the Steelers throwing into a crowd. Instead of four men, the Oakland secondary now numbered thousands. And against those odds, Lynn Swan threw in the Steelers' last chips. Now that Oakland convincingly proved that they were the best team in the AFC, they have a final challenge. Many have called the Raiders the best team never to have won the Super Bowl. On January 9th in the Rose Bowl, everyone will know the answer to that question. 
But win or lose, they have achieved something no team has been able to do for three years. Beat the Pittsburgh Steelers when it counts. For most teams, that would be enough to ease the chill of a long winter. For the Oakland Raiders, it is not.